Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Are you good? If you love Jesus, would you give him a hand? Come on. You deserve that. Would you welcome everybody watching in online? Would you give these guys a hand? Welcome to New Life Church. Woo. All right, this is what we're going to do today. I'm going to talk to you about the prodigal son. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the prodigal fa uh, father. And we're going to take communion. And I want you to take this card in your seat. And I want you to start writing down names of people that need to come home. Uh, when Pastor Rick and Michelle started this church, they started this church with this story in their heart. Because there are a lot of people in the state of Arkansas that needed to come back to Jesus. How many of you, that was you at one point? Amen? Okay, about ten of us. All right, how many of you? <laughs> We're going to have a great altar call today. All right. It was, listen, this is all of us, and this is our story, and I'm going to tell you, when we get into the Easter season, I want us interceding on people that need to come home again, and I want today to just, we're just teeing you up to get fired up, that when you come to an Easter service, bring some people with you all across the state of Arkansas this week. We're going to see hundreds and hundreds of people that are going to come home to Jesus again. Let God use you. If you agree with that, shout, amen. Let God use you because that was me at one point in my life. I needed to come home. There was a, a prodigal son that wasn't living like he should. Now, how many of y'all know what falsetto means when you're singing? Do you know? It means to sing out of range. Every 80s song was this way. I sing out of range just normal, all right? So it's just like in 80s music, y'all remember the song, uh, uh, Take On Me? Take on, come on guys, y'all ready? Me, take on me, take me on, take me. I'll be gone in a day or two. There you go. Sign me up, coach. My dream in life is to be on the worship team. I'm this far away. <laughs> there is falsetto singing, and then there's falsetto living, where you're living out of range. And I, falsetto, falsetto, I can't even say it. Fall, thank you. Brooke's like the Holy Spirit. She's just right there, wait, all right. Falsetto. There's falsetto living, and all of us in our lives have lived out of range. And we, listen, in this story, you see a son who asked for his inheritance early. Then he throws his life away. And then he hits rock bottom, comes clean, comes to his senses, and comes home. And when he came home, he was expecting the worst and got the best. Isn't that great about the father? You can like expect the worst and the, the inescapable love of the father just like attacked him. So I want you writing down some names and go, who needs this? And we're going to pray over them, and we're going to take communion, and we're going to take their names before a holy God, and we're going to see God begin to move in people's lives again. How many of you have faith for that? So here's this kid, and he, he asked, give me my inheritance. I mean, what a knucklehead. He said, give me my inheritance. And then he goes and he squanders and this story teaches us a lot of things when he squanders everything he has. Okay, the dad has a couple of sons. I want you all to write this down. Both of them are lost. One's lost at home and one's lost in the world. One is, one is secularly lost and one is religiously lost. But they're all prodigals, guys. And they all needed the love of a father. Matter of fact, what do you do in your house when you have a rebellious child? What do you do? You look at this story, and I'm going to tell you what you do. You just follow what this dad did, because he's the perfect father. Like in this story, his son goes, God, he, this is what he says. I'm going to read this to you. I'll start in verse 12. It says, Father, give me my share. Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son 
got all he had together. He liquidated his dad's assets. I want y'all to understand this. When he gave him his share, he got it all together. He turned land into cash. This is very important for the end of the story. He got all he had together and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. He begins to throw away his parents' value system. He started listening to country music, watching The View. It was crazy. All right. <laughs> and watch what the dad does. This, this is tough. I'm going to tell you this is tough. Uh, my parents did this for me. Uh, some of you are going to have to do this with kids at some point or people that you love. You know what he did? He let him go. Because there's always a power struggle between parents and kids. Isn't that the truth? I mean, they get born and there's a power struggle. And when they're born, you're in 100% in control. But sooner or later, you, that percentage starts going downhill. And sooner or later, you got to let them go. Now, my daughter is getting ready to graduate high school. And I hadn't thought about it at all until this week. And it hit me. I was like, oh my gosh, she's going to leave us. I mean, of all the money that I have invested, and then she's just going to walk away. I mean, this is what we're supposed to be raising them to do is to leave. But then I started thinking of, and then Brooke said, she's going to graduate, and then she's going to move away, and then she's going to meet a boy, and then she's going to get married. I said, that doesn't sound like the Lord. And it just, <laughs> but there is just this. <laughs> You got, listen to me. He let him go. He doesn't chase him. He released him. The son was saying, I want to go my own way. He said, go. And then the, it gets harder. You know what else he did? He let him make his own mistakes. How many of you would just like to make all the decisions for the people you love so that they could be perfect like us? You know what I'm saying? He let him make his own mistakes, this had to be, he squandered his wealth in wild living. Do you think the father knew he was going to squander some things? Absolutely. He didn't protect him. This is what he knew. Some people have to learn through pain in some areas of their life. And he let him do it. Last week, I'm coaching third base. My son gives up to the plate to bat. I had a runner on first. I give the sign for my, the guy on first to still second. I look at Austin, do all my signs, and I gave him the take sign. Take the first pitch so that this kid could run to second. And now he's in scoring position. Okay, I'm a baseball genius if you didn't know. All right, so I take the pitch. Austin looks at me, nods his head, yes. And the first pitch, he hit it to the outfield. And I went, did he not get the sign? And he stood on first and gave me the take sign right back at me. I thought, this prodigal son better make it home. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My goodness gracious. <laughs> Brooke said, you're mad because he's just like you. All right. The father knew. And he said, you're going to have to get out into the world and make your own mistakes. And sometimes you got to let life slap you in the face. Proverbs 20, 30 says it like this. Sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. Isn't that the truth? Sometimes we don't change because we see the light. Sometimes we change because we feel the heat. And this dad was like, and this must have been faith. This must have been hard that the dad goes, I'm going to let them make their own mistakes. And he let them reap. He let him reap the consequences. He's living in a pig pen. This was a time. I want you all to know this because a lot of us don't realize for much of world history, people could starve to death in this world. And still all over this planet. And it, we got past the depression when that was not the case so much in the United States, but in the Greek world, in the Roman world, it was part of their ethical system to not help the poor. They thought they need to learn. So here he is with these consequences. He says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. He began to be in need. He went and hired himself uh, to a citizen of that country who sent him in the fields to feed pigs, and he longed to fill his stomachs with the pod, his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything to eat. 
he's like, this kid needed life to hit him head on so that he could have true repentance. And that's what happens to him. He was like, I can go home. And he was thinking, what I say earlier? He was thinking, even if the worst happens, I won't starve to death. He went home expecting the worst. And then all of a sudden, he gets the best. When Jesus was teaching this story, it upset the religious leaders, this one here. This is one of the reasons they wanted to kill Jesus. And sometimes it was because of the way he treated sinners. And sometimes it was theology that he would teach. Sometimes he he would do good things on the Sabbath. But he taught them a revelation that they never had before. And I want you to write this down. It's the inescapable love of the Father. You can't escape it. How many of you know that there are some things in this world that's just inescapable? All right, you go to a a, a t-ball game and there's that parent that is crazy. Inescapable. Y'all know what I'm talking about. All right? Uh, there's, you go to the beach, and the sand at the beach is going to make it into your vehicle, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can take a, a, a shower, and you get into your vehicle, and there's still going to be sand everywhere. There's nothing you can do, all right? There's, there, there are things in this life that is inescapable. Uh, Turner Moore uh, sent this in. He said, the Razorback's dominance over LSU is inescapable, all right? <laughs> He's looking for a job right now, all right? My favorite thing is we go on Interstate 40, you get outside of Amarillo, and you pass those stockyards. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, my word. It is the best of your family sleeping, and I know about 10 minutes those stockyards are going to hit us. And I mean, uh, and it is inescapable. And every time they'll be taking a nap, we'll go by the stockyards. The, the aroma comes into the vehicle. And they'll wake up going, oh my gosh. And then I'm like, roll your windows down. It'll make it better. And then they roll the windows down. (laughs) It's great. (laughs) The inescapable love of the Father. This is what Jesus is teaching. You can't get around it. This This is what the Father is. Write this down. Second thing. The Father is the better prodigal. I didn't know this till this week. You know what prodigal means? The word prodigal means exceedingly generous and lavishly wasteful. And so many times when we read the story of the prodigal son, you know, sometimes we'll key in on the religious son. Sometimes we're like, he's a prodigal because he wasted everything. All right. But he was a prodigal in life. But the father, listen to me, was a prodigal when it came to love. He's also a prodigal because he is exceedingly generous. And he's lavishly wasteful. Like he takes his love and pours it out so generously on the younger son that it offends other family members. It offends. His love offended the older son. And this kind of love offended the religious leaders of the day. They would watch Jesus pour it out. And they would go, Why does he eat with sinners? Why does he go in the homes of tax collectors? Why does he talk to prostitutes? Because he's teaching us the inescapable, lavish love of the Father God. He is a loving prodigal. He pours it out on you because he's rich in it. Would you write this down? The Bible says that God is rich In mercy, verse 20, so he got up and went back to his father. Watch this. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. All right, I want y'all to see this. The father is sitting looking for his son. He's waiting, he's praying, he's believing, he can't wait to see him. But what did the son do? Do y'all remember what the son did? The son liquidated the property. When you see this, you'll never unsee this the rest of your life. Y'all listen to me. When the father is waiting on the son and he sees him a long way off, what is right in front of him? was all the property his son sold. 
And you know what the father did? He says, I'm going to look beyond my boy's mistakes to see my boy. Amen. This is what we do with people that have blown it. You can't ignore it. It's right in front of you. But you look beyond their actions and you look beyond. This is what grace does. This is the better prodigal. I'm going to look beyond that offense. I'm going to look beyond your worst. I'm going to look beyond your ugliest mistake. Because I'm looking for you. Aren't you glad that that's how God sees us? And I'm going to tell you, somebody, you're in this room. And you are thinking about the biggest mistake that you've made. Maybe it was this week. And you may have come here in your mind, you were kind of expecting the worst. Because you know what we think? We think that God is focused on our mistakes when he's focused on a relationship. He's not focused on your past. He's focused on your future. That's where the rest of your life is at. In this loving father, this is what he does. He, He faithfully waits. He's looking at him, looking for him. And the Bible says... He runs to him. And I'm going to tell you this. There is Christmas and Easter. There's a whisper of it in this verse. I want want you all to see it. He says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Isn't that Christmas? God was sitting somewhere in heaven and goes, we got to make a move towards my kids that need to come home. That's the whisper. And then the Bible says, he was filled with compassion and ran to him. That's a, little, that's a whisper of Easter. You know what he did? He took his robe up and he started sprinting. Now, have you ever, you don't see people in a robe start running. Not, not unless there's a bomb threat or something. You know what I'm saying? I mean, a robe, it, listen to me, it, it is dignity is what it is. That's what a robe is. And this is what he said. I will sacrifice my dignity to get to you. Isn't that what Jesus did when he hung on the cross? He was exposed before everyone. It's Christmas and Easter, just a whisper of it in this story. But listen to me. We talked about body language last week. I want to talk to you about it again. He ran and did this, threw his arms around his son and kissed him. Would y'all write this down? There is body language to grace. In the ancient world, forgiveness didn't happen through words. Forgiveness happened through affection. So how do you know that? I, how do I know I'm forgiven? Is that he kissed him. And when he kissed him, he was saying, you're forgiven. When he threw his arms around him, he was saying, you're forgiven. I want all the men to look up here at me just for a second. There is power in your affection in your home. And it's not just grace through your words. It's grace through the touch of your strong hands. And how you put your arms around the people in your house. And how you kiss them on their forehead. And you can speak loving words, but I'm going to tell you, that affection, you know what it does? It releases guilt. It releases shame. He loves him faithfully. And he receives him unconditionally. What is it? He doesn't go, oh, you need to go clean up. You need to go take a bath. He's like, if you'll work and get this land back, we can restore the family. He just goes, just exactly the way you are. It's how I want you. Amen? So I want you to look at these cards in your hands. And I want you to think about your own self, and I want you to think about the people in your life that need to come home. I think there's going to be people that haven't been in church in a couple of years that are going to walk in these doors and they're going to walk right into an atmosphere that we see between that father and son. There's going to be some people that are going to walk in these doors around Easter that swore they would never go back to church. They walked away from God. That's what this guy did. He liquidated the property and said, I'm never going to talk to my father again. You don't know. You don't know what can happen when the Holy Spirit gets to moving in our lives and through our lives. Amen. Why don't you close your eyes and let me pray right now.